Folks, we're actually a, a, a minute earlier than the scheduled departure, but uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's a warm evening, so we might as well, um, we might as well start. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you uh, for this one of our regular Democracy Forum uh, uh, meetings. Uh, you've uh, got the details of the uh, speakers this evening. I'm Bruce Grogan. and I'm the, the, I'll be keeping order at the meeting today. Uh, we have four speakers, uh, one of whom will be departing early and one of whom will be arriving late. Uh, but, uh, we, we rely, we have uh, absolute confidence that all will go precisely according to plan. The, the first speaker now on the running order will be uh, Deborah Mattinson. Um, who will be familiar, I think, to quite a number of you, who's uh, uh, a, a pollster. Uh, I don't know whether that's a polite word or not these days, is it? Uh, but many other things as well. Uh, uh, and she's been doing it for very many years. I won't, uh, I won't be impolite and say just how many years. And she's frequently uh, uh, acts as, a, uh, as someone giving a, a judgment on the public mood um, in, uh, in, uh, on the broadcast media and other outlets. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to have her here as one of our uh, speakers today. As you know, the, uh, the debate could hardly be more topical. It's about um, the first ever period of a fixed-term parliament, which is where we are at the moment. Uh, and, uh, uh, and unless someone changes the law, that's how we'll be, and we'll know that there will be a, an election in the year 3000. Whether we want the election in the year 3000 or not, the date is already marked uh, in the calendar. Uh, so um, uh, uh, that, that's a new parliamentary situation. Uh, I shall uh, introduce the rest of the speakers as we get along. But uh, Deborah is, uh, has to leave after she's uh, spoken um, uh, to go to another engagement. So uh, to give a, a view, maybe focusing particularly on the public mood and thoughts on these matters, I'll ask uh, uh, Deborah to start the start the meeting. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, I was asked to come along with, I suppose, a kind of pollster hat on and talk about um, the, the public's perspective on fixed-term parliaments. But in truth, if I did that, I wouldn't be here for very long um, because uh, I've got to say in all my years, and as, as Bruce has kindly pointed out, it's quite a lot, uh, all my years of doing political focus groups and polling and the like, I can't recall anyone ever saying to me, you know what we want, you know what we need to sort this out, it's a fixed term parliament. Um, and in fact I thought, well I wonder if anybody has actually asked that question. So I did a little sort of Google search of other people's polling data and I did manage to find a YouGov poll uh, from 2010 which asked people what constitutional changes um, they would like to see a referendum about. Um, and what that means, I think, in a way that's a code when you ask the public that question is, which ones do you care about or which ones are you interested in? Um, the top was membership of the EU. They would like to see a referendum about that. 43% thought that. Followed by changing the voting system for electing MPs, 33. Reducing the number of MPs, 28. These were all prompted. Fixed term parliaments came third from the bottom uh, at 16 ahead of equalising the size of, um, of uh, constituencies, 15%, and abolishing the monarchy at 14%. So the answer is people don't care all that much. So I thought I'd come at the question another way. I hope that's OK. I'm going to do two things. I'm going to tell you what I think the public would care about if they knew about it, all right? And then the second is knowing what the public do know, what do they care about for constitutional reform? And I hope that you won't think that's too indulgent of me, but I thought I'd just spend a couple of minutes talking about that instead. So, OK, if, if uh, the public were aware of the pros and cons uh, or the changes that might come about as a result of fixed-term parliaments, which ones would they approve of and which ones would they not approve of? I think the things that they would like are... The fact that there are fewer elections, because they don't very much like elections, or they like them a lot less than <laughs> me and the people in this room. So uh, pre-fixed term average, um, ele elections were happening every three years and ten months, and obviously it's now going to be every five years, so I think people will like that. Um, I think they would like the sense that there's less game playing going on um, by politicians as the incumbent loses the advantage that they've had historically um, by being able to choose when to go or when not to go. 
And I think they like the idea, if this, if this is indeed an outcome, of, of having more stable government and perhaps better planning and you know, civil servants having a better sense of, what, of what's going on. So I think those are the three things that they would like. Um, what would they not like? Um, and this is the sort of law of unintended consequences. I think what they won't like is the fact that it's almost certainly, and I think we're already seeing this, going to result in very long election campaigns. So you get fewer elections, but actually you get much longer campaigns, which I think is fantastic. But most people, um, you know, when you see the short campaign extending to fit the time available, will not like that. Um, and I think also boring party conferences or maybe I should say even more boring party conferences because you know maybe one thing that interested the electorate a little tiny bit about party conferences was the thought that there was a little bit of tension about whether or not you know there might be some clue as to whether there was going to be an election I remember the party con Labour Party conference in 2007 and there was a bit of a buzz around that that I think even the public got into a little tiny bit well they won't have that anymore either so so those are the things I think they would like um, and wouldn't like if they, uh, if, if they had a point of view which they don't much. Um, so what do they care about? I'll just spend a couple of minutes on this. Um, and the first thing I'm not going to talk about, but it's obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway. The public care about the things that affect them. So they care about the economy, they care about health. Constitutional reform honestly is quite low on their list, and you all know this, I'm sure. So, you know, I'm telling you something you already know. Um, but when you do get people to think about constitutional reform, what are they interested in? And at Britain Thinks, we recently did um, a workshop for the Fabian Society, where we invited a kind of cross-section of the public to uh, come and to hear some pitches from uh, Westminster insiders who were going to sort of talk about different ideas that they had about how you might change politics. Uh, so the public became, if you like, the, the dragons in the dragon's den. Um, I, I won't go through what all the different things were that people pitched, but it was things like lowering the voting age and, and, and so on. What I will um, talk about is, I think, five things that we learnt as a result of it, which are just quite interesting and maybe can relate back a bit to kind of reverse engineer them back into thinking about fixed term a bit. Um, so what are the things that people care about? What did we learn? Um, the first thing is that ch any change needs to be rooted in an understanding of what voters think is wrong with politics. Um, so what happened, actually, was we had these four Westminster insiders pitching their ideas, and actually the Dragons all rejected, the voters all rejected the ideas they pitched because basically they said they don't pick up on what we think is the problem with politics because nobody tackled what they saw as the problem with politics, which was politicians themselves. So um, what then happened was that the, the, you know, the, the voters said, let us come up with our own idea, and they came up with an idea for changing our politics, which was about having much stricter rules about the behaviour of MPs. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is that what they wanted was greater involvement of um, ordinary people in the decision-making process. And time and time again, they quoted test question time as being a great way of achieving this. And I don't mean when I say question time, PMQs, which they think is a really bad thing in politics. I meant BBC's question time. They like it because what it does is it, it puts politicians up in front of ordinary people who can ask them questions and get answers. Um, and holding politicians to account is a good thing. What else? They wanted to see any change reflected locally. Basically, national, national politics, with its focus on Westminster, what happens here, is deeply alienating to people, and they would really like to see any change in their own constituency, in their own place, in their own <coughs> street. <coughs> what else? The fourth thing that we learnt um, is about communicating change really clearly and really well. The most successful of our dragons, of our, um, of our Westminster insiders pitch to the dragons was Rowena Davis. Now that wasn't because what Rowena Davis's pitch was was a good pitch because I can't even remember what it was. It was because she told it well. And she stood up in front of them and she said, I'm going to tell you a story. And then she told a little anecdote about something that had happened in her patch, <coughs> in her local authority, and then she extrapolated that out to make a bigger point, and then she made a pitch, which was actually for, I think, for greater 
decisions being taken at a local level or something. Anyway, that would not really matter. The point was, they actually fell in love with her because she told the story well and in a way that they could relate to and understand. And politicians don't normally do that. And then the fifth thing is, and it's a thought to, to sort of leave you with, I think, is that I, I know what I'm saying is gloomy, and it's gloomy to a lot of people who want to talk about constitutional reform. I would say that there is actually hope um, and I think this because for all that I've spent really a larger part of my time than what probably was ever healthy for me or anybody else listening to people moaning about politics, in the end, although people are fed up to the back teeth with politics and politicians, on the whole, most of them still do turn out to vote in general elections. And that probably is a bit of a triumph of hope over experience, but I think there is hope. So there. Thanks very much indeed, Deborah. Now, um, the next one on the list um, uh, is, uh, uh, is Mark, who's going to uh, talk to us. Uh, uh, Mark Darcy is going to talk to us about, um, uh, on the basis of his experience as a BBC producer and a presenter, you'll be familiar uh, with him on a number of parliamentary programmes. We've got stars of stage and screen here, one way or another, with Deborah and Mark. So, uh, uh, Mark, would you like to say a few words uh, to us? Thank you, Bruce. Um, I think, first of all, it's worth looking at the origins of the Fixed Term Parliament Act. It was something that the Coalition wanted, partly for its own internal cohesion, so that it would be sure of holding itself together, and partly to guarantee itself enough time that it could see at least light at the end of the economic tunnel over five years. Uh, there may have been people in the room arguing purely from principal reasons that a Prime Minister shouldn't have a power to call an election at the time he wanted, etc., etc. But I tend to think that, like most constitutional change, this was actually driven by the expedient of the day above all else, and that's why we've got this particular measure in place. And is that of itself a sort of maggot in the bud of the Fixed Term Parliament Act, that it was a measure to some extent of expedience? Uh, does that mean that it can safely be dropped by an incoming government that doesn't like that? I don't know. Um, I, th I tend to think that most constitutional change, as I say, is driven not just by a sort of academic desire for a more perfect constitution, but much more by the need to fix an immediate problem that has a real head of steam behind it. And incidentally, the reason why we didn't have Lord's reform was, was I don't think there was ever a real head of steam behind it outside um, a relatively small section of the population sparing the blushes of the noble Lord Lord Tyler in the corner of that. Um, I think that was always the problem, that it simply didn't have the broad support that was needed to push it through, and therefore it didn't get through. Fixed Term Parliament Act did have the broad support within the government. It was an absolute priority. They got it. It's in place. I, I nurture a slight suspicion that some of the critics in the opposition to the Fixed Term Parliament Act, on taking power, were they to do so, in 2015, might suddenly develop an affection for the idea of a guaranteed five years in power. Call me cynical, but uh, I suspect that then, as they contemplate the years ahead, the idea of a relatively guaranteed term and enough time to allow their measures to unfold might seem to be no bad thing, just as it seemed to be no bad thing to David Cameron, Nick Clegg and George Osborne a few years back. So those are the first immediate points about it. Should it be changed? A very, very interesting question. What are the complaints against the Fixed Term Parliament Act now? One is that because there isn't the immediate danger of an election being called at the drop of a prime ministerial hat, that this means that to some extent the excitement goes out of politics and because there isn't the immediate danger of an election being called because a government has suddenly lost a confidence vote, that Parliament has become less important. Um, come again with that one? Uh, Parliament is less important. This is the Parliament that stopped an intervention in Syria that a Prime Minister was calling for. This is a Parliament that decided that it wasn't going to allow the government to push through uh, the Lord's reform that it wanted to. This is the Parliament that has forced uh, the current government into a very different position on the EU and holding a referendum on the EU that it wanted. Now, you may be for those things, you may be against them, but you can't deny that they're pretty important things to have happened and to have happened as a result of votes in this Parliament. So we have a Parliament that is actually taking more active and more effective a role in monitoring and scrutinising the executive, for good or ill, 
than any Parliament I've ever reported on in uh, a disturbingly long time working in Westminster. So I would suggest to you that Parliament does matter, and the Fixed Term Parliament Act has very little effect, any uh, parenthetical impact at most, on the fact that a a relatively weak executive is now being scrutinised by a noticeably stronger Parliament. So I tend to, I'm afraid, slightly dismiss that part of the argument. Now, another argument is that the end year of the fixed-term parliament cycle is, first of all, a long glide into the general election. Well, glide might be too serene an adjective for what happens there. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you call it. A long squawk, a long shouting match into the next election might perhaps be a better way of describing it. But anyway, too long a period of pre-electoral tension, but at the same time, too long a period when Parliament is left with essentially non-controversial, routine, tidying up legislation, not really enough to do. That argument, it seems to me, partly boils down to that MPs and peers are a bit bored because they haven't been thrown enough legislative red meat. And uh, as as a journalist, you can sometimes feel that you, you, you kind of wish there was a little bit more excitement too, but I'm not sure that's a good enough reason to give it to us. Should laws of the land be made simply to keep parliamentarians and journalists entertained? It seems to be a slightly odd proposition, and I'm not sure I would agree with it. So, again, I am slightly sceptical about it. I I think the chronic campaign argument is probably the single strongest argument for thinking again about the length of a parliament. But, again, uh, I'm not sure it's that strong an argument, even if it is the strongest of the bunch. I think that the central problem is that the biorhythms of Parliament have not yet adapted to a five-year term, that people don't quite know what to do with this additional year. Bear in mind that on the normal rules of politics, we probably already have had the post-2010 general election by now. It 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 might well have happened a couple of months back. Tony Blair, of course, took less than four years to call his first general election after, after gaining power, if memory serves. And even then, it was delayed a little bit because of the foot and mouth crisis. So, um, you know, prime ministers like to go at a moment of their own choosing. I'm not completely convinced, incidentally, they should have that power. It seems to me a bit of gamesmanship and a bit of advantage that maybe they don't need in the political system. And, and actually, one of the better arguments for a fixed term parliament act is that it stops gamesmanship by the Prime Minister stops the governing party gaming the system to an unfair extent over all the other parties um, and of course if you're sitting in power that seems like a jolly good thing but I think if you're out of it maybe it, it, it looks a little bit less incidentally if I can add here one thing that makes the fixed term parliament act work for the country in so far as it does is that we now have an independent Bank of England just imagine knowing the precise timing of the next general election and being able to fix interest rates accordingly for short-term advantage. That would be a fairly toxic combination for the economy, so uh, we can all heave a sigh of relief that that doesn't occur. Um, so, coming back to this biorhythms point, if we have a situation where Parliament doesn't quite know what to do with itself because by now it really feels it ought to have had an election, and yet it's still got some way to go till it gets one, how do you fill the time? And it strikes me that you don't have to do that by by passing great screens and phalanxes of landmark bills on this, that and the other. It seems to me that MPs and peers could start thinking creatively. We've got a year here where we don't necessarily think we're going to get lots of really hot, cutting-edge, party-politically controversial legislation. But there's still plenty we could do. We could take a look back at some of the legislation we've already passed. Why not invent a process for post-legislative scrutiny and look back at how the Legal Aid Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Bill has played out? Or look back a bit further to some of the legislation from the previous Labour government. Maybe you'd need a bit... That would, I'm sure, inevitably stir up a bit of political controversy, but why not take a look at a Labour bill and a Conservative bill, or you know, a government bill and a bill from the previous government, and uh, see how they are playing out and have a genuine debate about the effectiveness of that legislation, and possibly even propose amending legislation to sort out any problems that have emerged. That would be a reasonably constructive use of time, and the public might even like to see MPs addressing the problems of the laws they pass, rather than simply passing ever more new ones. Uh, So that's one possibility. Another is that uh, Parliament could focus a bit more on big issues that are not especially party political and deal with those. You've had people calling for, for example, (coughs) a civil service bill for for decades. Well, why not 
prepare one and spend the last year debating that. You know, the, <coughs> the general public is not going to vote according to the content of the Civil Service Bill, but it might all the same be quite a valuable improvement to the machinery of government, something that a lot of top civil servants feel is needed. Why not do that? There are plenty of other subjects that could be addressed in that way that are not at the cutting edge of electoral controversy, but are nonetheless important. So a bit of the boring but dull and necessary stuff could be done in that final year, and MPs could still leave Westminster at 12.33 on a Wednesday after Prime Minister's question time and head back to their constituencies <coughs> if they're feeling, for example, the hot breath of UKIP on the, on the back of their neck. So it, it, there are plenty of ways in which you could accommodate both politicians' natural need for a deeper communion with the electorate in a pre-election period and still get something useful done while you're here. I just don't think that mindlessly attempting to pass any, any old legislation that's controversial just to have a party political ding-dong is a particularly sensible use of time. We do have, incidentally, a, a slightly odd complaint here. The usual complaint is there's too much legislation being rushed through too far. Uh, a few years ago, I, I holidayed in the Dordogne, and uh, one of the charming artefacts you can pick up in the Dordogne are sort of peasant statues of peasant women stuffing food <coughs> down the throat of geese to make foie gras, which always used to strike me as a good metaphor for Parliament in, uh, when the government's going to hyper-legislative mode. But you have that complaint at the beginning of a Parliament, and then you have this complaint of too little legislation. At the fag end of a Parliament, what we perhaps need to aim for is a kind of Goldilocks Queen speech, which is neither too big nor too small, but just right. Uh, at the moment, it seems, though, that we oscillate between hyperactivity and uh, torpor. Uh, and time could there, uh, it, it seems to me there's a clear case that time could be better arranged across the Parliament than it is at the moment. Maybe people need to take a slightly less annual look at things and have a slightly longer term legislative plan. I was looking back at some statistics from the first couple of years of the um, 1945 Labour government, which was hyperactive in legislative terms to a degree it's almost impossible to imagine now. I think they passed something like 86 statutes and that <coughs> figure off the top of my head. Um, by that standard, I think MPs in the current parliament don't know they're born. You can do an awful lot with parliament <coughs> if you're willing to, but at the same time the institution should be perhaps respected a bit more and should be, give, should be allowed to accommodate itself to a new electoral cycle. But that means that the people in it, above all, have to think creatively about how they're going to do that, rather than, uh, frankly, whinge <coughs> that the, the things aren't being done in exactly the way they're used to. Uh, I'm afraid that's a slightly magisterial rebuke for me to finish on, but uh, that's, I think, increasingly my reaction to some of the, the complaints that, that people make. Well, Mark, thanks very much indeed for that uh, uh, coverage, particularly from the perspective of someone who reports on these things day in, day out. I particularly like the reference to the 1945 to 51 uh, Parliament, um, uh, a, a golden age which some of us are old enough to remember. I mean, it's uh, not too many in this room, I think. Uh, Right, now our third speaker uh, is uh, uh, Dr Ruth Fox, who is uh, the Director and Head of Research of the Hansard Society, um, whose uh, output during the course of the year includes a lot of things uh, uh, other than matters relating to the Fixed Term Parliament Act. Uh, perhaps the most notable this year, I suppose, Ruth, has been um, the report on Prime Minister's Question Time, which um, uh, received an awful lot of uh, publicity, as do so many of the reports of our society during the course of the 12 months. But now I'll call on uh, Ruth to make her contribution. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks, Bruce. Um, I just wanted to reflect on a few things regarding the, the Fixed Term Parliament Act itself and then some observations about the final year and whether or not um, the existence of coalition uh, would make the situation different um, as opposed to whether we'd had a, a single party government. Um, the reality is, as researchers, we can't actually test it. It would be nice to have them running in parallel and we could do a perfect analysis, but, but we can't. So we won't know until we revisit uh, majority government again, if, if we ever do. Um, Mark alluded to, the, to a, a sort of a, a cynical uh, perspective on whether the, the reasons behind the, uh, the decision to go for the Fixed Term Parliament Act and perhaps a, a rather more um, party or coalition uh, uh, advantage to it rather than political principle around the powers of the Prime Minister. 
um, and questioned whether it would actually be revisited. I mean, there is actually a provision in the Act itself to revisit it, but in 2020, which of course is the year of the next general election after this one. So um, unless um, the, uh, the government of the day wants to repeal it in some way or, or amend it in some way, um, that's the point at which it may, may formally um, be revised. But that is at the behest of a prime, the Prime Minister who has to establish a committee to, to review it. And it would really go back to that issue of, is there the will in Parliament to do it? Is there the will in government? Because I think Mark's probably right that by the time uh, a new government comes in, they too will like the idea of, of, of five years ahead. But one of the reasons we were sold the idea of a fixed-term Parliament was very, very heavily, was not just principle, um, but that it would bring certainty, that it would help planning, that it would improve government, it would improve Parliament as a result. The kinds of things that Deborah, in her presentation earlier, alluded to being one of the attractive propositions uh, for perhaps for the public, um, that, that it would improve, improve government would improve policy making, policy development in Whitehall, it would improve an, the approach to the public finances and the planning of those, and it would improve the planning of the legislative programme. Um, and I guess the question we therefore have to ask is, is there really, has there really been an improvement? And whilst Mark has alluded to the fact that it's a fairly light legislative programme at the moment, um, I would um, wager a fairly large bet that we will have, at the end of the Parliament, going into to March next year, we will have the same rush to um, bang through the remaining bits of legislation that they haven't yet finished, um, known as, as the wash-up, the legislative wash-up, that we have had at the end of every other Parliament, because they have not planned it properly, because there is, um, the, the, the allocation of time has not been great, because legislation emerges too late. At the last, just before, before the last election, the wash-up was particularly controversial because of when we had bills rammed through um, with almost no scrutiny at all. And what you're talking about, uh, you know, then we had the Digital Economy Bill, which had received very little scrutiny in, in the Commons. Um, and what it does is hand to the House of Lords an awful lot of influence over the um, remaining stages of the legislative process and really leave the, the, the crossbenchers in the House of Lords bargaining with the government of the day about which bits are going to get through and which bits are going to be lost. Um, I think insofar as there is going to be a wash up next time, ne next March, it's going to be really interesting how that plays out because last time there were a lot of complaints from the Liberal Democrat peers that they had been excluded from this process with the government of the day negotiating with the crossbenchers. So you're going to have that negotiation in play, but you're also going to have the inter-party discussions within government about what they're willing to lose and what they're, what they're not. So I think it's going to be interesting how that, that plays out and it's going to be something to, to look out for. Um, in Parliament, we would have hoped that you know, it would provide greater capacity for planning for things like select committees. And I think it is going to be interesting how they respond to this. Because the reality is, although we might want them to creatively uh, work to look at, to look at new areas, um, to look at perhaps at doing uh, reviews of, of, of previous legislation, the reality is when you get into the final months, the very, the very process of select committees when they're at the most effective, the consensual nature of their work becomes more difficult the nearer you get to an election. So I think that that is going to be interesting to see how that plays out. And again, in terms of planning, they know when the election date is going to be, they know when dissolution is going to be. Are we going to see what we had in previous years where select committees are under pressure to rush out all of their reports and we get lots of very good reports being banged out towards the end, a lot of them on the same day. They don't get the coverage, they don't get the consideration that they perhaps deserve, again, because of a, a lack of, of planning. And, of course, the government, uh, in, terms of, in terms of their planning, one of the um, key things that knowing the next date of the election would facilitate is planning for the next government, for the incoming government, whatever that might be. Um, and the government has had the option to really formalise the relationship with the opposition in terms of how the civil service engages uh, with the opposition parties in planning for the post-election period should they win. Um, but again, you know, in the last parliament, when we didn't have a, we had a rough idea when the date was likely to be, but we didn't have an absolute date. Um, the previous government um, was facilitating um, consultation between the civil service and the opposition for, a, for over a year. Um, the current government has said six months. 
Um, I think that that could prove to be problematic, particularly when you have got um, Liberal Democrat ministers and Conservative ministers with access to civil service to support right through probably to, to the election if the coalition holds. Um, where the fixed term parliament may help is actually in parliament itself in terms of the induction planning, the programme for the, for, the, for the new parliament, um, in terms of the, the general election planning group here within uh, Westminster, planning for the induction of the new members, for their orientation. It will be an awful lot easier to do. However, there is a slight difficulty in that the fixed term parliament fixes the end of the parliament but it doesn't tell us what the date of the new parliament is going to be, which I think is a fundamental flaw in, in, in the, the, the whole process. Um, so we won't know the actual date when parliament reconvenes until we get the dissolution announcement. Um, and it could be a week, it could be a fortnight. It, it, you know, last time it was, it was a couple of weeks. Again, if it's looking likely there's going to be coalition or hung parliament uh, negotiations for a pact or something, then they might want to extend it um, even possibly a little bit further. But we don't know when it will reconvene, so the, still parliamentary officials will be working on, on estimates. A couple of things I just wanted to reflect on in terms of the run-in to, to, to the election, the election itself, that haven't really been aired very much uh, yet, particularly in the media, I think, which may come up um, if uh, events play out um, as there is a possibility. Um, relating to the coalition, whether it goes to the bitter end, um, two thoughts. If the coalition um, breaks up just before the general election, which is possible if it's under serious pressure, um, and the, under a fixed term parliament, what's likely to happen is the Liberal Democrats would withdraw from the government, they want some clear blue water from the, from the Conservatives, and effectively you end up with a confidence and supply agreement, a pact in all but name, to allow the government to go through to, to March 30th next year. But if the Liberal Democrats were to withdraw, there is a potential scandal waiting to happen in relation to ministerial severance payments. Because if, minister, if Lib Dem ministers withdraw, they will be entitled to a severance payment equivalent to about three months' salary. Assuming that it's a number of weeks before the election, you will have to have, at least in some departments, probably the appointment of some new ministers, at, certainly at Secretary of State level, on the Conservative side. Those Conservative ministers would serve probably only just a few weeks in office. Were they to lose the election and not come back, either as a majority government or in a, a, a coalition or minority government situation, were those ministers to lose their jobs, they too would face ministerial severance payments immediately after the election. And if the Liberal Democrats were to come into government, either through coalition um, uh, yeah, with, the, with Labour or conceivably with the Conservatives after the election, were any of those Lib Dem ministers who'd received their severance payment uh, a few months earlier to be back in government, they too would then be back in receipt of a salary. And the way the legislation is currently worded would mean that there is nothing that you could do to prevent that. So the way that the severance payment legislation is set up doesn't really work in a, a coalition situation. So I think that's something to look out for, because you can imagine if that does happen, in the event of a big row, the Daily Mail headlines. Secondly, election timetable. The election timetable has been extended from 17 to 25 days for the next election. Easter will fall in the middle of that election campaign, which itself will affect, I think, the rhythms of the campaign uh, in a quite interesting way. But what that means, and I can't claim any credit for this, because it was actually one of our uh, research students from Hull University who discovered this, who's in the audience, uh, Isla, um, in helping me prepare for a select committee appearance uh, a few months ago. What that means is we will face the longest period without a parliament since 1924. Um, and what we're looking at is dissolution on the 30th of March, um, and we're looking at about five and a half weeks. We're then looking at assuming that after a polling day there'll be a couple of weeks before parliament reconvenes. You're not far short of two months without a parliament. Now, I think um, you know, some, there are some people who say that that doesn't matter, you know, we just, it's, it's part of the process, we just rub along with it. I actually think if you say Parliament matters, Parliament has an important role scrutinising the executive, to be without a Parliament for nearly two months, with no ability to recall it because it does not exist in the event of a crisis, I think that is a quite worrying development, that we're getting longer, a longer period over an election without a parliament for the combination of um, the extension of the timetable and possibly longer periods 
uh, in the event of needing more time for coalition or hung parliament negotiations. Um, and interestingly, you know, in the event that the coalition holds through the election, that is a pretty long period in the most highly politicised environment that we face in that, over that period. It's a pretty long period for collective responsibility to hold during PERDA in the event of a serious problem arising. And I think you know, we've seen collective responsibility has been strained within government. Imagine how collective responsibility might be strained uh, in a situation where um, you know, we were in an election period in the event of a, of a problem. So I think there are some, some potential. These things may not play out, but it's worth having on our radar as we think about the election campaign. There are some potential issues that might arise depending upon how the politics of the, the next uh, coming months plays out. Well, Ruth, thanks very much indeed for that. I think that's a pretty good advert for the Hansard Society, asking questions about how the system actually works, um, uh, which none of us quite know the answers to at the moment, but no doubt will in due course. Uh, right, our fourth speaker hasn't arisen, so I shall... Uh, uh, don't worry, I shan't ad-lib for a quarter of an hour until, uh, uh, until he arrives. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll start taking a few questions. We've got to finish at 8 o'clock, so we'll, uh, we'll um, start taking two or three questions uh, and then, as and when Professor Philip Norton arrives, uh, uh, we'll, um, uh, we'll, we'll cut to him and let him make his, uh, his contribution. I've got three or four people asking me, so let's take one. Shall we should take a batch of three, shall we? Uh, and then I'll call on Ruth and Mark to respond. Could you just give me a name, please? Yes, thank you. John, you're a member of the society. A couple of points. Uh, first of all, um, would a f fixed four-year term uh, have any advantage? And secondly, if a panel could just enlighten us a little bit further about the trigger mechanism that could have an earlier election in the event, that is, of the parties not being able to uh, sustain a government. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, uh, Paul, we, we, and, uh, yes. I'm, I'm trying to put this in a form of a question, but as you know, both houses are rather good at putting question marks at the end of a statement. Um, first, a confession. Um, I was elected in, in uh, February 74 and was kicked out again in October 74, and therefore I have a private interest, not in severance pay, but simply in having longer parliaments, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, and second confession, uh, two or three days before polling day in 2010, I wrote to three or four of the national newspapers suggesting that the circumstances were such that we could not afford to leave with the Prime Minister of the day the right to call a general election at his or her whim because we were clearly in a major economic crisis and therefore whatever part was elected should have the opportunity to actually tackle that problem, having seen what Harold Wilson did in the summer of 74, which is of course to take no decisions on anything to avoid getting into any difficulty and as a result he managed to get some sort of majority in, in October 74. My question is really, um, having now heard Mark obviously uh, reacting to a number of things that I've been suggesting recently, which is really worrying that anybody should actually read or listen to what we say in the House of Lords, um, surely what we should be saying now is if we are going to have fixed-term parliaments for the foreseeable future, how do we avoid the London bus syndrome, you know, a lot happening together? How do we manage more intelligently the actual business of Parliament to spread it over a five-year period without getting into the ludicrous situation which has been described so well already this evening that everybody thinks they must pack it in at the beginning and then run out of steam at the end. And I very strongly agree with the idea that we should have post-legislative scrutiny in the final uh, year. But I can't understand this objection to the fixed-term Parliament Act, that somehow or other it increases the amount of last-minute electioneering. Because if you just take the maths that Deborah gave us earlier, that the average of previous parliaments is three and a half years, it just means, of course, we've had more electioneering over that period. Because just taking the example of when Gordon Brown took over, you know, there he was... Uh, trying to decide whether or not to have an election, how much advance of five years? And for the, all the months thereafter, there was electioning. So can either of our panel explain to me why the five-year parliament makes for more electioneering 
than anything we've suffered from during my political lifetime. Right, so take uh, one here. Then, then I do want to uh, encourage everyone in the uh, in the stalls or wherever you are to uh, to chip in as well. Uh, but yes, please. Uh, my name is John Cartledge. Um, as a citizen, I'm called upon to take to cast my vote in elections for six different public bodies, two parliaments, three levels of local, three tiers of local government, and a police commissioner. So most of the electoral activity that goes on and most of the electioneering at which local party apparatchiks are called upon to participate in has nothing to do with the Westminster Parliament. That's only a sixth of the total. There's a lot more, you wouldn't know it reading or watching the national media, but there's a lot more electioneering going on out there than has anything to do with Westminster. Now, if there is a compelling argument for having maximum terms rather than fixed terms, if there's a good argument for going back to that, why does it only apply to Westminster and not to all these other bodies? Why don't they have the right to dissolve themselves at the moment convenient to them? But conversely, if there is a good term for, a case for having fixed terms, why do they all have different lengths of terms in office? Why are they not synchronised on a common uh, period? Very interesting questions. Um, uh, now there's a collection there. Mark, would you like to uh, uh, select the two or three you wish to answer and then Ruth will uh, act as sweep? Thank you. Um, well, I, I, I cut my teeth as a local government reporter reporting places with a fixed electoral cycle, precisely the kind you describe. And um, I, I think it did all the things that Ruth said. It helped them plan their own work. They knew they were in for four years. If there was an adjustment in who was governing who was the majority in, in, in a council over that time, they, they dealt with it uh, as they went along. Um, and it, it all seemed to work fine. I've never quite understood why it's impossible for Westminster to assimilate something of that culture, and it would probably do it good. Elections all on the same day. Um, well, in America, of course, you can vote for everything from dog catcher to president with a single pull of a lever in some states. Um, maybe it drowns out the different issues pertaining to different bodies if they're all at the same time. just be on the same cycle but consecutive. Well, conceivably. I, I, I think that they are on fairly fixed cycles, most of the rest of them, but uh, I, I would be wary of putting, say, uh, an election for the Scottish Parliament on the same day as an election to the UK mm -hmm. Parliament, simply because you've got two different executives with two different records and two different parties in control, perhaps. Uh, and uh, I think it could get uh, an awfully jumbled set of messages reaching a public who might prefer to switch over and watch a soap opera instead. Um, so I, I, I'm all in favour of there being fixed, comprehensible cycles that people can understand. I thought it was absurd, for example, to have police commissioners elected in November as a ludicrously low poll, when those are potentially quite important, powerful officials. I'd much rather have seen it done in synchronisation with some local elections. I'm sure that the police commissioners themselves would prefer to perhaps had a slightly more uh, imposing mandate than the one that they ultimately ended up with. Um, Four-year parliamentary term? Oh, I mean, to some extent, we're in a game of think of a number here. Uh, I mean, we used to have seven-year parliamentary terms in this country uh, not all that long ago. So, you know, you, you, 100 years ago. Well, you know, it's before 100 me. years here, 100 years there. <laughs> you know, um, you know, there's various people who will remember that, various people who won't like this. So, you know... I, mean, I sometimes get the feeling that there are some members of Parliament who, when they first entered the House, um, confidently expected 30% of their colleagues to die of the plague. But uh, things have changed a little. Anyway, um, I, I, I think you, you pick a number and stick to it, frankly. There are, you can make an argument for almost any integer, and uh, I think you, it, it, can be, it can all become a little bit Jesuitical if you try to do that. So I think five years seems like a good goodish length to try. If people are genuinely uncomfortable with it after a couple of terms, I dare say it can be revised upwards or downwards or sideways or whatever. Uh, but I, I, I can't see there's a vast question of principle o o over the number at all. Um, um, trigger, uh, trigger mechanism was another quote. Do, Ruth, do you want to handle that one? But, uh, that was another the second part of your question, wasn't it? And then Paul's about the management of results to take those risks. Um, yeah, I thought this might come up. I was rather hoping Lord Norton would be here to handle it, but as he's not, I actually brought a note because I could never quite remember the detail. But an election can be triggered before five years if a motion of no confidence is passed by simple majority and 14 days then elapses without the House passing a confidence motion in any new government that has formed. <coughs> now, it, it, his, I mean, the fixed-term parliament has changed the concept of no confidence. 
in the sense that it is formally, it must be a no-confidence motion. Um, and um, then there is, if, if the no-confidence motion is passed, then there's 14 days for the parties to negotiate and figure out whether a government can be formed. And if it can, then you know, Ed Miliband could conceivably emerge with the Liberal Democrats to form that government without an election, providing he can then win a confidence motion in the House within that 14-day period. Um, a motion for a general election can, can be agreed, um, providing it's won by two-thirds of the House, <coughs> including vacant seats, effectively 430, 434 votes out of 650. Uh, you could force a general election in those circumstances, um, which obviously the two-thirds majority makes that tricky. Um, and there was a lot of debate at the time of the Act itself, when, when the legislation was going through, about the concept of Conservative backbenchers having to vote for a motion to effectively dissolve their own government to have a general election, which is a sort of a you know, curious concept. So that's, that's the circumstances in which it can happen. Um, would a fixed four-year term have any advantage? I mean, I tend to sort of tend to Mark's view. Four, year, four years, it's think of a number. But there was simply a, a, consen a, a greater consensus around four years at the time the, the legislation was being discussed because that is more in line with international norms and more in line with, with our cycle. And the sort of, you know, Mark's point about the biorhythms of Parliament, it just seemed to need a better fit. Um, but I don't, I don't think you know, there are huge advantages uh, or disadvantages either way because fundamentally you're not dealing still with the planning issue and the certainty issues and, and the bene getting the benefits out of that process. Um, so going to Paul's point about how do you manage business more effectively, I mean, I do think at some point you have to start thinking quite radically about, well, in a, if you've got five years, um, the value of a Queen's speech annually, um, particularly when it has less relevance in the context of uh, confidence motions, um, is called into question. Um, I think you know you could look at what, say, the devolved legislatures do in terms of you know you don't have this annual cycle of legislation after the Queen's speech with a cut-off date when Parliament is going to um, finish that, that, that year's work. And therefore, you're, again, you're, you have the sort of the equivalent of the, the, ge the general pre-general election wash-up you have every year just before the cut-off. Um, you know, the, of course, there is the option for carryover of legislation here, but it's not used that much. Um, and I think, you know, thinking radically, it could be about saying, OK, well, rather than having this annual cycle, we have a parliamentary cycle of five years, and we might want... You know, a Queen's speech at the beginning, and you want, might want something midway, but do we really want this annual process? Um, and I think that is a distinguishing feature between local government and, and, and national government and parliament um, in terms of you know, why perhaps local government is, is more effective at managing this process, partly because they've been doing it longer, but also because they haven't got that annual pressure to get things done, to drive things through. Yes, if there are local district council or county council that's elected on thirds, um, you know, on an annual three three years out of every four, they'll face a different kind of pressure in terms of how they manage business. But they'll know, you know, at the beginning of the year what their political makeup looks like, whether there's going to be a loss of seats sufficient to change the uh, direction of the council or not. Um, but that's a rather different challenge to the one that Parliament faces in terms of this constant annual pressure to push legislation through to, to, to a particular cycle. And I think the problem is that we have changed, by, by fixing the Parliament at five years, we've changed the way we think about the length now, but we haven't changed the way we think about how we move from year to year. Um, and we're still fixed on that annual concept. Um, and certainly, I mean, back in 2010, when we published our report, Making Better Law, a form of the legislative process from policy to act, that was one of the things we said that needed to be looked at, that maybe looking at what some of some parliaments like the Scottish Parliament do to, to manage the process might be better. But I would miss the doffing of hats or the prorogation ceremony. That's right, that's right. That's right. Are there any from the... I, I, I know... Yes, uh, yes, please. coalition or a minority government and the opposition parties don't want to bring down the government because they can't afford another election or whatever but they don't let the government do anything. What happens? How do they break a logjam if the opposition parties I'm don't sorry to interrupt election? but I don't know about anyone else but it, it, because the bells went just uh, as I'll you would you start again? Parliament next time have a coalition or a minority What happens if that fails to achieve the objectives of the coalition? 
this legislation through, but the opposition parties are so weak that they don't want to force another election. Surely you would have a just total logjam and have to break that logjam if the opposition parties don't want to vote in their confidence and they don't want two thirds to vote for an election. Because now, Right, that's uh, uh, even uh, uh, for a second time answering. That's a pretty tricky one to ask. It. That's a pretty tricky one to uh, uh, to answer. Who wants to have a go at that? I suppose you get gridlock. Um, <laughs> but you always have a prime minister, don't you? That's the point. I mean, you're never without. Well, I suppose you could be without a prime minister, but for the prime minister to go to the Queen and say, I don't want to be prime minister anymore, um, there's generally the odd recruit that's willing to uh, fill the gap. Um, uh, and as long as you've got a prime minister, you, to be blunt, you, uh, you don't have to have a parliament until such time as uh, supply is needed to be uh, voted to uh, provide funds to, to run the country. But I, I don't know if anyone's got a better answer as to what we do if... Um, if no one's willing to come forward in a fixed parliament, I'm looking desperately to Ruth, who's... Uh, yeah, no, I, I, can see, I, can, I can see the point. You put. Well, in truth, that's what often cements coalitions. It cemented the Lib Lab pacts in the 1976-79 parliament, and to a degree, I don't want to be too partisan here, or sounds like I'm being very partisan, but... Uh, quite a cement in the early part of this coalition at the moment is that neither party would want an election um, because neither would think they'd do uh, particularly, particularly well at it. So that, that's not uncommon parties not wanting elections for, for, that, for that reason. Um, uh, but, but I was going to, uh, well, I was going to ask, invite Philip to answer, who's, who's the, uh, uh, the academic here, but I don't know whether you heard the question, did you, Philip? I've just been informed what the question is, yes. Right, OK, well, you could, could you answer that question and then give us your contribution? This is oh, Philip, right. Philip Norton, um, uh, well, a speaker on a wide range, lecturer and broadcaster on a huge range of uh, constitutional uh, parliamentary issues over many years, a uh, member of the House of Lords. Uh, Philip, would you like to... Right, thank you very much. Uh, apologies for being late. I've been taking part in a debate on the importance of books uh, in the civilised uh, society. Um, so I thought I'd, when I'd arrived there'd be questions, but I was going to suggest someone might like to ask me what I was going to say if I'd turned up on time. Um, <laughs> in terms of this particular question, I mean, it's a very good one because um, it, it identifies a lacuna in the Fixed Term Parliament Act. Um, there is no provision for a government that implodes um, and cannot then, is then not voted out on an explicit vote of no confidence. It's important to remember in the Fixed Term Parliament Act, um, and I may say more about that in a moment, um, there can now only be an early election if the House of Commons votes for a motion that this House has no confidence in Her Majesty's Government, or if two-thirds of all members vote for uh, an early election. And it's important, because the Act was refined, to be explicit as to what the motion should be. So it does limit government. Government can no longer, the Prime Minister can no longer stand up and say, well, on this particular substantive motion, um, if we lose it, there's an election. Confidence attaches to it. Well, you could say that now, but they could not then trigger an election in the event of a loss of a vote. All they could do is do what uh, was one half of the old convention, because under the old convention, if a government was defeated on a vote of confidence... Um, the Prime Minister, the government can either <coughs> resign or request dissolution. Now, the practice was to request dissolution, so it triggered an election. You can't do that now, but it would be open to resign. But if the government resigns, what then happens? It does not trigger the provisions of the Act for within 14 days a new government to be formed, get a vote of confidence uh, from the House. So, presumably, it just be open season for uh, negotiations. Um, perhaps the incumbent government could seek to reform itself um, and, and, and carry on. But you could get um, internal uh, conflict, government not being able to uh, govern in effect, but, as I think you're touching upon, situations in which the other parties um, would not necessarily vote for a motion of no confidence because they may not necessarily be able to afford a general election, either politically, they're not nationally winning in the opinion polls, or indeed financially, given the cost of elections. So one could be in a situation where we have no government, but there's no election. Well, what is sometimes known as the Belgian 
uh, situation. <laughs> um, but that's where we'd be in, because there is nothing to actually govern us on that. And perhaps that would lead into the points I was going to make anyway, because they were about fixed-term parliament. Because I think to understand where we are in the last um, year of a fixed-term parliament is to recognise we are in a unique situation. And it's unique for two reasons. First of all, we've got a coalition that was produced as a con con consequence of a hung parliament. We've never had that before. We've had coalition governments, we've had hung parliaments, but we've not had a coalition government formed as a consequence of a hung parliament deriving from a general election. And the other uh, feature is what we've just been talking about, Fixed Term Parliaments Act uh, 2011, took effect on, what, 15th of September 2011. We now have Fixed Term Parliaments. I'm amazed by the number of people who seem to think it only applies to this parliament and don't recognise every parliament hereafter is going to be for a fixed term uh, of five years, unless an early election is triggered in the circumstances uh, uh, I mentioned. So that act will carry on. We may or may not have uh, 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 coalitions. So I think we've got to recognise we are in that, uh, I say, unique situation, but the fixed term will cease to be um, unique because it will be uh, a feature of our politics. And one of the uh, consequences of the Fixed Term Parliament Act is the provision within it. I've dealt with votes confidence. But the other point, of course, is it stipulates a five-year term. This was much debated, hotly debated when the bill was going through, not least that certain parties had in their manifesto a preference for four years. Um, but the compromise, well, the, the, what was agreed was um, a five-year uh, term. Um, so... What are the implications for that? Just for reason of time, just very quick. Um, it strikes me that in this uh, fifth session, you're going to see a notable imbalance between the two houses. Um, there's going to be a light load for the Commons. There's not a heavy legislative um, programme. Uh, MPs are likely to be absent. Indeed, when I was at the meeting today, when one was saying, well, I'm a marginal constituency, I'm going to be busy on the doorstep for much of the rest of the period between now and uh, next uh, men. So there are going to be distractions for members of the other house, partly got the Scottish referendum, but thereafter not that much time between that and the general election and indeed prior to that when the house rises. So Parliament's only going to go on to the end of next March. It's not a long period. So for much of that period I think the Commons end will be sort of lightly uh, staffed or, or, or lightly populated uh, by members, even less so than has tended to be the case. In contrast to the Lord's End, which I think will be kept fairly busy, so <laughs> if, like, the, the heavy work um, uh, will be carried uh, by the Lords. And really two reasons for that. One is you've got the legislation promised in the Queen's speech. What's often overlooked is the number of carryover bills. So quite a few bills coming dealt with the Commons last session, they're just reaching us now. So we're in the process, we've got eight bills either just had second reading or, or, or scheduled. So we're going to be, um, so the heavy lifting will be done by the Lords, and I suspect that may well be the pattern in future Parliaments, because that last uh, year, that last session, there will be focus on the part of government opposition uh, to the next election. Members will be focusing on that. It'll be left to the Lords to do whatever um, legislative uh, heavy lifting uh, needs to be done. Um, so, to some extent, Commons will be on autopilot. I think that has implications for the continuation of the coalition, because there won't be that many great issues or great legislation um, that the two parties need to deal with as a coalition. So I think it will facilitate uh, uh, the coalition um, um, going on. You'll get a conflict between the parties, but outside the palace. Um, so uh, I think, given how close we are now to the end of March and Parliament rising, uh, I, I can see the coalition going on, and there may not be um, an incentive for the Liberal Democrats, say, to, to break off, because it'd be too late, I think, to establish uh, an independent entity, uh, and looking at it a bit more properly, uh, ministers like being ministers. Um, so there may not be those pressures that some have identified, so I wouldn't be surprised if it goes up to um, uh, the election. Uh, and for reasons of time, I think I'd better uh, draw it to a close. But I think that's the, the key point. I think the coalition probably carry on.
but within a parliamentary context, context, the last session likely to be fairly light, but heavier on the Lord's side, will be kept busy, MPs will be um, uh, busy, but, but not here. Thank you very much indeed. Particularly thanking you because um, you did come in just at a very opportune way, an extremely good question uh, from the back there, which uh, you were able to deal with. Now I've got two or three asking to go. Yes, please. Yeah. Anyone else over there indicating? Yeah, go on. Go. Uh, Nicholas Baldwin. Uh, Philip, uh, I'd like to ask you, um, following on from what you've just said, a coalition doesn't formally break up till a new government comes into being unless one party wants to withdraw another. How would you see an election taking place with ministers fighting each other from different parties but of the same government? Are there any constitutional issues at, question, uh, at, at place in such an event? Well, that was a specific question to you, Philip, so I think I'll put it straight in your court and then... Uh, yep. Shall I? Yes. yes, yes. Uh, uh, no. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would like more. Um, uh, from a constitutional point of view, no, because ministers remain in post until such time as a new government's formed. The Prime Minister will remain in number 10, and that was quite clearly demonstrated at the last, ele at the last election, and that has been you know, enshrined in the Cabinet manual. Um, and post-elections, we saw after the last election, ministers are not taking great policy decisions. It, it's, if you like, it's administration, it's not policy. Um, so you had a number of ministers who were in post who were no longer in the House of Commons but they carried on as ministers. So that, that would continue um, while any negotiations, negotiations were going on or uh, until such time as um, the person that the Queen was going to invite to form an administration was called the Buckingham Palace. I was thinking the, more particularly that during the election campaign oh, itself... I, I don't think that's a problem because it, it'd just be an, a general election with by-elections by we've seen writ large. I mean, you've had ministers going into places like Newark. Um, so um, we've had other contexts, including referendum campaigns, where ministers have, have been on both sides. So I don't think there's that much of a problem about campaigning, particularly if it's forward-looking, where you're saying this is what my party will do if elected, rather than you're not on a platform having necessarily defend departmental policy, but ministers would do that. But I think it though there is that experience um, uh, by elections for that matter, uh, European Parliament So the it, collective, it, collective responsibility though is not an issue during the election Well there's an issue about, there's an, well there's a serious question about to what extent it actually applies now, now. now. Yes. Um, uh, because on, in one vote of course, uh, ministers voted against the government uh, and the Convention of Collective <coughs> Responsibility was not suspended there are precedents for it being suspended. Um, but the convention was not suspended, it was ignored. I think it really, part of this relates to the point you were making at the beginning, Philip, that um, it's not just the fixed term parliament that's new, it's the fact of a coalition government that's new. And, uh, and we simply don't know, as Ruth mentioned this, um, uh, what characteristics of the constitution that's working at the moment are a result of fixed term and what the result of, uh, of coalition. It changes uh, yeah. 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 I, and. Uh, I wanted, Ivor gave a, a member of society, I wanted to um, um, widen it a bit to out there beyond Westminster because um, Philip said it was hotly debated. We heard earlier Deborah, on the other hand, saying there's very little interest. I, I want to look back and look forward very briefly. Mark said, I mean, I, I want to ask Mark why I think there was very little media debate about what is a big, big constitutional change. It was not a major issue, but of course it wasn't a major issue because it happened very soon after the coalition government. And it surprised me that it wasn't a big issue. And it worries me because I don't <coughs> think if you polled out there, I, don't, I think there's a very low level of awareness of the fact that there is a fixed term parliament. Um, and that concerns me, obviously, a part of the part of the democratic deficit debate or the disengagement debate and I'm just wondering whether um, the political parties um, or even the Hansard Society ought to be involved in some sort of <coughs> educational mission because I think it's going to come as a surprise to them. 
and um, you know, uh, it was a fail- speaking as somebody works it, it was a failure of the media not to do it, and it will be a continuing failure because you say to the majority of Marx colleagues, him being an honourable exception, there's a really interesting constitutional issue going on here. They'll say, yeah, yeah, but who's sleeping with who? So, um, you know, I, I think it's a big issue that we, we, we can't solve here, but we need to be aware of when we're discussing all these intricacies, but there's a bigger issue. Do you want to uh, respond to that or not? Well, wearing my anorak of office, um, mm. I find constitutional issues interesting. Um, an awful lot of people out there don't. And what you've also got to remember about the formation of the coalition is there was an awful lot of very interesting things all happening simultaneously. There was a new prime minister. There was a new cabinet. There was the sheer novelty of a coalition government. There were big economic announcements coming down the track. There were all sorts of big policy decisions flying around in all directions. And faced with that pile of really big, important news stories, I'm afraid fixed term Parliament was some way down the batting order. And that, I'm afraid, is show business. And I think the other point that needs to be made, I wrote, maybe this sounds like a, uh, a slightly cynical observation, but the truth is it was one of those uh, constitutional changes which was supported by all three political parties. Um, uh, the Liberals had a long-standing commitment to fixed-term parliaments. Uh, the Labour Party had been committed to them very briefly before the last, the previous general election while in government, and the Conservatives came to agree to it uh, as part of the coalition uh, deal. And um, there are some of us who, uh, the members of Parliament, who say that the worst kind of legislation, <coughs> the worst kind of legislation, is that that the results from absolute agreement between all three uh, parties. Partly for the practical reason that you'd never then have an intense debate of the merits. Uh, so maybe that's that's part of the answer to the question. Uh, right. Who else would like to have a go? Let's see at the back. It's been an entirely male uh, operation so far, but uh, anyway, if there are no, yeah, uh, uh, th- there's two of you there. Would you like to both uh, contribute? Um, I wonder if the panel can comment: Is a uh, fixed term parliament better value for money for the taxpayer? Right. Good short question. Value for money. Uh, can we take the next one as well? Then is that uh, Oliver Savory? Um, I sometimes think with the public. They don't actually care too much about constitutional issues and with things like the um, whether or collective responsibility has been broken or not. For most people, they don't care. They go, well, they're different parties, so why would they agree? What they do care about is that Parliament often doesn't seem like it's, uh, it necessarily can be effective because if you have a backbench debate, then a vote on it isn't binding on the government. Um, so you can have issues where Parliament votes on something to, which is against government policy but then it carries on. Is there any way, if there's going to be more time in uh, five years, to bring in either sort of private members' bill, having a greater choice, or having legally binding motions from Parliament so that the, um, these votes, which will fill the time left by uh, having an extra year, can actually mean something? Right. Two interesting questions. Value for money and uh, responsiveness to uh, the public. Um, who wants to have a go on that? Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, well, sorry, I'll do, it. I'll do a sort of Tony Benn and answer the question before the one I was actually asked. Um, uh, it ties in with the point as well about the fact that um, uh, people aren't that greatly interested in constitutional issues. So, fixed term Parliament bill was not exactly um, uh, uh, within most people's daily conversation. Um, and you can't rely on the media to educate people about it because in the media they didn't understand it um, either. Uh, and you still get commentators <coughs> saying, oh, the coalition may split up, we may be in for an early election. Well, no, we're not. Um, uh, and then the number of people who probably re- actually read the Fixed Term Parliament Act that time, uh, are probably not uh, 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 numerous. So um, I, people don't know about it. Um, so they're probably confused about what the old system was and just as confused about what the new one uh, is and probably don't lose any sleep about it either. Is it for value for money? Um, I suspect not because of the rigidity it, it brings into the system. Um, following from what I said in opening, I think this last session will not necessarily be that uh, productive, um, either in terms of what Parliament does, but also in terms of what government does. Because I think in the last session, what you get is not a government pursuing policy, you get an administration. Um, and I think that that, that, that is um, a problem. You're right, I mean, the time could be spent fruitfully uh, within Parliament debating more issues. I, I 
don't want to go down the step of legally binding motions. That creates all sorts of uh, constitutional issues. I don't necessarily want to see more private members' bills enacted, but I'm all for private members' bills being debated because that's their great value. It's actually issue raising uh, and getting it, uh, bringing issues onto the agenda. So I think the main role is an agenda setting one, not actually determine an issue through legislation. Because I think despite what a lot of people think, private members' legislation uh, is highly problematic in, in terms of accountability because there's no one body that can be held accountable by electors uh, for measures of public policy that are being enacted. So I'm all for using uh, the time, but then that raises an issue in terms of who's actually in control of the time. Uh, and I think there's an issue there about um, whether, particularly at the Lord's End, we start to rest control um, of uh, how we actually allocate uh, time. So there is things we could be doing, but it's in the context where overall, I don't think it is value for money. Mm. There's also, the, the, there is a practical, very interesting question about how to use the time, but there is a really practical problem for politicians that, that if there are debates, discussions and private members' bills indeed, which, um, uh, which Parliament spends its time debating, the problem with them is they don't um, uh, necessarily or indeed are pretty unlikely to end up in a legislative outcome. And the problem then is that the public raise it. It's happening mm. quite spectacularly mm. at the moment with um, the assisted dying mm. bill, for example, mm. uh, which is coming to the House of Lords uh, a week on Friday. Now, um, that may or may not become law, but to, to put it mildly, um, it's got a very long and hazardous route as a private member's bill that's got to get through both houses before next March. Yeah. But the public outside, it's a highly emotive issue, a very important issue, um, which engages the public greatly. Uh, they think something's going to happen when, in parliamentary terms, if a government doesn't take it on, and if it's not a government bill, um, it may well not uh, happen. But that's just a, uh, an observation as far as public perception is concerned. Paul, we'd better make this the last question because we're nearly well, at It's not really a question, but I just wanted to take issue with um, Mark and Ruth particularly about uh, pick a number. Because um, in my 40 uh, years as a qualified elector, I have voted in 10 elections, general elections. If we slightly optimistically said everybody had 64, years vote, 64 voting years available to them on average, mm -hmm. under a five-year parliament, they would get 12 elections if they were lucky, and under a four-year parliament, they would get 16. Now, I genuinely resent having my opportunities to throw out a government reduced. I really do. I think it's the most important democratic right I have. And I think this complacency about... Um, you know, oh, it's take a pick a number, it's four years, five years. And I'm even more resentful, which is not often, people say nobody's noticed about the fixed time parliament. Um, they then had to move all the uh, devolved bodies onto a five year term in order to avoid, and that was done almost as nobody noticed. Yeah. You know, I mean, they were all set up with a four year term, and everybody knows four years is natural. And the real problem with being in the fifth year of a parliament is I just feel bored and fed up. I want, I want an election. Um, I've always had an election. I've had an election every four years on average, or three and a half years, Deborah Matheson tells me, and I want another one. And I'm feeling, you know, really quite resentful about that. That's very cool. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry you're bored. I'll buy you a box set. <laughs> Well, well, I think you'd I, have to pay for them all. That's what I'm Bring back the confidence convention. I think that needs no response, Paul. We should have put you on the, on the panel, basically. Um, right, look, thank you all very much indeed for your attendance. It's so, glad, so pleased that on an issue which certainly interests me and obviously interests everyone in this room, that people has, have turned up because it's undoubtedly, whether the public are observing us or not, it really is an important issue and it affects us. Paul so rightly summed up at the end uh, our rights in terms of our ability to take part in elections. So thank you all very much. Thank you.